Well, thank you for the uh, invitation, Mr. Guineri. And thank you, Mr. Hoven, for taking time out from your divinical studies to share your latest thoughts with us. I'm not here to defend the theory of evolution. I'm here to present a little bit of the evidence that supports the theory. It is supported by uh, an overwhelming number of scientists, contrary to what Mr. Guineri has already asserted. Now, I'm going to talk on fossils and I'm going to talk on genetics. I want to talk on fossils for the first 15 minutes because I believe they're the key to the subject. If there were no fossils at all, I'm not sure we would be here today. I'm sure that it would have taken Darwin a good bit longer to figure out a theory of evolution. Imagine that creatures happened to just vaporize when they died, so they left no traces at all. That's just a property of life and we're aware of it. We know that uh, uh, we don't expect fossils, but still, there's an absence of evidence from the past that's disturbing. Well, that's not the case. Creatures don't vaporize when they die, and they often leave imprints which get covered up and are maintained over long periods of time. Now, you may not know or guess how many fossils have been discovered in the last 150, 200 years, but there are well over uh, 100 billion fossils that have been discovered. There is one fossil field in which it's estimated there's 80 billion vertebrate fossils alone. There are tens of millions of fossils that have been cataloged, described, dug up, and deposited in museums and similar institutions around the world, and they've been studied. Whatever else you want to say about evolutionists, they haven't been lazy, they've been doing their work. Now, what does this huge fossil record tell us? It tells us several important things. First of all, it tells us that 99.9% .9 of all species are extinct. That is, the fossil record largely consists of creatures that, have, uh, that are not existing today, that have no counterpart today, uh, but are different kinds of creatures, dinosaurs, for example. Uh, okay, so for every one species today, there were a thousand that went extinct. Furthermore, the fossil record you know, I'm wondering if this thing is causing the feedback here. Oh, okay. Um, there's a little bit of kind of feedback loop here. Anyway, if you look at the fossils, they're organized vertically um, with, as we understand it, the top layers being more recently deposited than the deeper layers. And with some exceptions, of course, the general rule is that simpler, more congruent, and s smaller species are located lower down in the fossil record. By congruent, I mean species that fall in between uh, species that you would find today, for example. So you can go back, and I'll tell you about dating in a moment, to about 150 million years ago, and you find that mammals converge on a mammal-like reptile. If you take all land vertebrates, they converge uh, to a fish that resembles uh, a coelacanth, a lobe fin fish. Now, um, the third thing that's worth mentioning is this same pattern is found the world over, again with exceptions, but you can line up strata in Australia, you can line up strata in Europe, you can line up strata in North America, and you find similar sets of creatures as you go down similar levels. Now, this pattern alone, with no other argumentation, suggests at once evolution through time, because you expect creatures to begin small, simple, and congruent. You expect higher strata to be more recently deposited. You expect creatures to become more complex over time, to increase in average size over time, and to diverge which is exactly what the fossil record shows. Now, in addition, we have a completely independent system for timing uh, these fossils. And this is dating the systems that's been developed by geologists based on chemistry and physics. It has to do with the radioactive decay of unstable isotopes. So, for example, carbon-14 is produced, we know, in the outer atmosphere. 
It is taken up by living creatures, but it decays. However, in the living creature, it reaches a steady state because it's continually taking in uh, new carbon-14, and these steady states are well uh, studied. When it dies, it no longer takes in any calcium-14. The calcium-14 in it just decays, and it decays so far as we know at a steady rate. Calcium-14 is only good back to about 50,000 years. It has a half-life of about 5,500 years. Now, at the other extreme, you have potassium argon, which has a half-life of about a billion years and is good for timing events from 100,000 years right on back to a billion, more than a billion. You have dozens of other chemical systems which have intermediate time scales over which they work well, and you have overlap among these systems, and you can look to see whether your dating systems give you congruent results. And they do indeed. It is not true if you use uh, carbon-14 and another method that's also good for 50,000 years that you get divergent results. You get congruent results. So we have some confidence that we're able to date these strata, and we also show through the dating that the assumption that more higher up uh, deposits are more recently deposited show less decay. The system even works for tree rings. There are trees that are four or 5,000 years old and whose age can be counted by rings and by which you can check to see whether carbon-14, for example, is working. Now, at the time of Darwin, uh, there was a sufficient fossil record so that devout Christians who were also serious scientists had to imagine 20 separate creations followed by 19 obliterations, the most recent creation being the one we're living in, in order to make it consistent with a simple-minded reading uh, of certain sections of the Bible. Uh, after a while, it becomes easier to imagine that God lets the world evolve than to put him or her to the work of continually creating and saying, oops, I got that slightly wrong, destroy the whole thing, start over. You'd have to have tens of thousands of separate creations uh, and one less obliteration uh, to uh, fit the data uh, according to this theory. Now along comes this character, and he says, hey, I can solve this. What about the flood? So he imagines that the flood miraculously killed off the earlier creatures, Apparently, Noah violated instructions because he discriminated against dinosaurs and other creatures with nostrils, didn't allow them on the ark. And then in one marvelous swirl, somehow deposited these dead creatures in this highly organized pattern we see, repeated the world over. Now, um, this violates expectation if you, if you think about these dead creatures swirling around in this dreadful flood. You'd expect heavier creatures to fall deeper, for example. You don't. The heaviest mammals are right at the top. The dinosaurs are 150 million years old. They're not way down there at the bottom at, say, a half a billion. So this view is absurd on its face in just trying to uh, describe the actual evidence we have on the existence of fossils. But matters only get worse if you take this thing seriously, and that's what scientists do, and they do calculations. So they say, okay, you want to believe in this? How hard does it have to rain in 40 days and 40 nights to fill this water up to the point where it can then explain all the fossils? Well, it has to rain about 11 feet an hour. By comparison, a one inch an hour is a heavy downfall. One inch an hour for 24 hours causes hills to give way. But you're talking about a rainfall that's two inches a minute. It's a rainfall you've never seen and can't even imagine. You'd walk out and splat. You'd be on the ground from that amount of water falling down. Matters get only worse. I didn't know before uh, preparing for this uh, debate or whatever it is that well, when it rains, heat is released. Uh, and someone sat down and done the calculation. Well, if you have this monstrous level of rain occurring, you have an enormous release of heat. And the calculation is that the resulting water is roughly between two and 6,000 degrees. A boiling cauldron of water produced by this vision 
of Noah's flood, killing off marine fish, freshwater fish, all kinds of vegetation beneath and so on. And yet somehow magically 6,000 years ago, the water all managed to evaporate back down to our placid level of existence uh, right now. Now there are big absurdities and there are small ones. A small absurdity has to do with fossil footprints. I've seen hominid fossil footprints in Olduvai Gorge dated to three uh, million years ago, look human, but they're smaller. I've seen dinosaur footprints. I've seen bird footprints. How on earth are all these creatures able to leave footprints with this mass of rain coming down, scouring uh, whole uh, um, hills down to nothing, but magically leaving uh, fossil footprints? Um, then you've got... Uh, uh, other problems. The fossil records show that recent creatures uh, in the fossil record just below the top are located where the current ones are. So you find marsupial fossils in Australia. Now how do you assemble these creatures? Noah sends word, I need two lions from the Serengeti, male and female. I need two uh, kangaroos from Australia. And don't exhaust yourself on the trip here, by the way, because you've got a hell of a trip back. You're going to be walking on mud hundreds of feet deep just to get back to where you belong. And matters are worse still. Uh, what about disease? Um, almost all human diseases have to live inside humans. There are some like malaria that have a mosquito intermediate host but the rest go just human to human. So those ten humans uh, on Noah's Ark have got to have between them all the human diseases. Of course, if you've got a creative mind and unconstrained by reality, you can invent an ad hoc hypothesis for that. Ah, the diseases came from other creatures, but they left no uh, remnants back in those other creatures. Our diseases do not resemble closely the diseases of other creatures. And the same argument that applies to us applies to every one of the other species on the ark too. In other words, when they call for two lions from the Serengeti, they say, be sure one of you is bringing half of all lion diseases and the other is bringing the other half. Sick unto death they have to be to maintain biological diversity of diseases. So to summarize, we, we're being asked to replace a coherent, logical story based on millions of pieces of evidence, carefully analyzed and organized, and, and are offered instead a fanciful tale with a dreadful view of God's world, a cataclysmic world, a disaster of, of unimaginable proportions, which nevertheless had the magical power to splat, produce a fossil record that imitated what you'd expect if evolution took place. I thank you. All right. Well, thank you. It is an honor to be here, and I appreciate Dr. Trivers coming. It is extremely difficult to find professors willing to defend the evolution theory. Uh, I've been turned down over 3,000 times. Uh, this has just had a few debates. I'm just a simple high school science teacher that is sick and tired of the kids being lied to in their textbooks. So we'll cover all the points that he made as time permits here. If I forget what, bring it up during the question answer session. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Let me present the creation viewpoint uh, clearly and succinctly. So uh, people say, you don't have a you guys don't have a model that you offer. Yes, we do. It's very simple. God created everything about 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days. This is the only possible way that I can see to explain what are called symbiosis relationships where thousands of animals require certain plants or certain plants require certain animals. For instance, in the termite's gut, there's a little critter that lives in there that cannot live outside the termite. The ter termite cannot live without that little critter in there. Which one evolved first? And how did it live for millions of years without the other one? That is only one of literally billions of examples that can be found in nature that are best explained by a simultaneous creation just in a few short days. Then I believe there was a worldwide flood about 4,400 years ago that completely destroyed this planet. I think that's the only logical way to explain the fossils. There's a phenomenon that takes place during uh, floods called a cavitation and another one called a liquefaction. We can get into more of that later. 
Um, uh, if you shake up a jar of dirt with water in it, it'll automatically settle into layers for you. And it's interesting, during a liquefaction, when, uh, if you go out to the beach, like I live in Florida, six miles from the beach, if you go stand knee deep in the water, as the waves come by, the high part of the wave is lower, is, is higher and heavier than the low part of the wave. This presses down on the sand, and then when the low part comes by, it relieves the pressure. And if you go underwater with goggles, you can actually see the sand grains hopping up off the bottom. And particles are automatically sorted based upon their density just by the pressure of the waves coming past. During Noah's flood, you'd get a liquefaction problem that would be incredible because you'd have no, no continents to restrict the tides, and the tides would be probably a 200-foot tidal change during Noah's flood, explaining the sorting of the fossil record. Reptiles are found in the similar layer because reptiles have similar body density. There's a lot of reasons. We'll get into more of that later. So the Bible view teaches that before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. There are thousands of legends from around the world of cu cultures talking about what they called the Golden Age, when people used to live to be a thousand. I mean, the Greeks talked about it, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, and the Bible certainly says Adam was 930 when he died, and everybody before the flood lived over 900 years. Reptiles never stopped growing, and as, as well as squids and most octopus and stuff like that, they simply never stopped growing. So I believe before the flood came, the reptiles grew to be huge, and dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, just giant lizards. And then Noah took them on the ark, probably babies. He was smart enough to figure out, just bring two babies. Be sure to get a pink one and a blue one, though. And so that's the Bible view, that dinosaurs uh, were called dragons through most of history, since the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. And people throughout the last 6,000 years have killed nearly all of them. There may be a few stragglers still around. There's certainly been an awful lot of sightings of various creatures, and that's the study of cryptozoology. There's a couple pictures of ones that washed up on the beach in California in 1925 on my website, if you care to go there. So science means knowledge, to know. It is systemized knowledge derived from observation and study. There is no observation that tells us a dog ever came from a non-dog. Now, if you'd like to believe that, that's perfectly fine, but that is not science. Evolution, whatever it is, is not science. It is a religious worldview that people choose to believe in, and that's perfectly fine. You can believe whatever you want. But I, for one, am sick and tired of them taking our tax dollars to teach this religion in our school system. That's my take on it. I am, I'm certainly not against science. I like science. I like it very much. As a matter of fact, we have a science center, a hands-on activity center. We have a museum. We have all kinds of activities for kids. We actually like science. I don't know any Christians that don't like science. There may be some, but I don't know them. I like science, but I'm sick of the kids getting lied to. Now, Texas has a law that requires the textbooks to be accurate. So does Florida. So does Wisconsin. So does Alabama. So does California. Most states require textbooks to be accurate. All I want is accuracy in the textbooks. All of the evidence that's used to support the evolution theory has been proven fraudulent, and I'll take any bit of evidence you want. We'll show you which one it is. They use all sorts of about 50 different things. I don't have time in 15 minutes, obviously. But this fellow says, evolution is a fact. This is called a mantra. You say it over and over and over, and pretty soon you start believing it. He says, the evidence for evolution comes from the fossil record. The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. I would like to point out, if evolution were on trial in a court of law, Absolutely no fossils would count because you can't prove those bones had any kids. You sure can't prove they had different kids. And why on earth would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? By the way, there is no fossil record. You don't look back in the fossil record. You look at fossils. You put an interpretation on them, but they don't come with a date on them, and they don't come with a card saying this was you know, made by a dinosaur 80 million years ago. So the, when somebody says, we looked back in the fossil record, oh, you don't either look back in the, you dig up a fossil and it's 2003, okay? You're putting your interpretation on that bone, but you don't know for sure when that thing lived. The word evolution has six different, totally unrelated meanings. First, there would have to be cosmic evolution. This is a major obstacle the evolutionists have to overcome. You have to have somehow the beginning of time, space, and matter. The Bible answers that in 10 words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then you have to have chemical evolution. I've never had an evolutionist tackle this one. I wish they would, because if the Big Bang theory is true, the Big Bang made hydrogen and possibly some helium. Well, how did we get 92 elements plus the synthetic ones? I know you can fuse them in stars, but then you, gotta get, uh, you can't get past iron with fusion. So you've got a real problem here. And then we'd have to have stellar evolution. Stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen a star form. They've seen a couple of spots get brighter, and they say, oh, wow, star forming. You don't know a star's forming. It could be the dust is clearing. There's a star behind it. There's no proof any star's ever formed out there in space that we've seen form, but we see them blow up all the time. 
They're called novas or supernovas. That's the opposite of evolution. It's backwards. There's enough stars out there that everybody can own two trillion of them to yourself. I mean, it's not like there's a lack of stars to go around. Those are just, those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. Um, <laughs> then we'd have to have what's called organic evolution. Somehow, somewhere, long ago and far away, life has to get started from non-living material. The evolutionist is left with a very embarrassing position in believing something that's been proven wrong for over a hundred years. He still believes in spontaneous generation. Life had to get started from non-living material. Now, I don't, I don't want to hear about all the experiments you say, well, it might have happened or we might be able to do it someday. It, the fact of the matter is, it's a religious belief. You have to believe that it happened. And you're welcome to keep that belief. I don't care what you believe. But don't call it science. And don't make everybody else learn that junk. You keep it at home or start your own private school and teach evolution to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. Okay? Then we have what's called macroevolution, where the animal changes from one kind to another. Nobody has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Never. Science is things we can observe and test and demonstrate. All of human history shows us dogs produce dogs. Period. Microevolution, I think, is a lousy word and we shouldn't use it, but they do, so I'm going to explain what it means. It actually means just a variation within the kind. Variations certainly happen. Sometimes some real bizarre variations happen. But they're still the same kind. The first five meanings of the word are purely religious. What happens, though, Students are given one definition of this word evolution, and then they switch the definition on them. It's called bait and switch. According to the Big Bang Theory, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Man, that's one crowded dot. <laughs> For some unknown reason, this region exploded. It's called the Big Bang. They cut down a tree to print that. Where's Al Gore when you need him? That's what I want to know, yeah. <laughs> this textbook says, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled and, a rocky, and formed a rocky crust. Yes, boys and girls, the planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. And then as the Earth formed, the surface was similar to the moon. It was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Yes, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> Boy, I guess it is. Doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This college textbook says the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So I think a fair representation of the evolution theory would be 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. Some say 16, 15, whatever the number. You pick it. I don't care. And then 4.6 billion years ago the earth formed. And it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup. And the soup came alive somewhere around 3 to 3.8 billion years ago. And this first life form found somebody to marry. Uh, there's a good trick. And something to eat, of course. And slowly evolved into everything we see today. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. <laughs> now, I uh, spoke at a college in Boston one time, and. Uh, they said, I can speak to the college if their professors can ask me any questions they want because they wanted to show the students how dumb the Christians really were. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> and so I got my charts out and told them what I believe. You know, 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, big flood. And then I told them what they believe. You know, uh, 20 billion years ago, big bang. 4.6 billion years, of earth cooled down, et cetera, et cetera. And we all came from soup. One professor said, uh, Hoven, he said, there are two to 300 varieties of dogs in the world today. Do you mean to tell me that all those dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? <laughs> you're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> now, I spoke at one university, and afterwards this lady came up to me, and boy, she was angry. She said, tonight you said we believe we came from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, ma'am, calm down. You're going to blow a gasket here, man. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, okay, then where did we come from? She said, we came from a macromolecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, and where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. It was so cool. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. 
I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? Yeah, you certainly do, okay? Anyway, so that's what their theory teaches 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. Co cosmic, chemical, and stellar evolution would have to take place in the first, you know, X number of billion years. And then we'd have to have organic evolution somewhere, somehow, long ago and far away. Life had to start from non-living material. This has been proven wrong for years. Francisco Reddy, Louis Pasteur, come on, you guys are in the 14th century if you believe that. And then you'd have to have macroevolution where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. And finally, the only one that is scientific is what we call micro or simply variations. That one is science. The first five are religious. Going just from micro to macro would take a giant leap of faith and logic. Okay? That's a fantasy based upon imagination. You've got the other four stages too, by the way. This textbook says evolution is change over time. Now watch how they change the definition on the kids. Evolution, in other words, there is no doubt that living things have changed over time. Oh, now they jump down to living things. What happened to the first four? You're just going to skip them and assume that they're part of science? They really much want to, they really much want to skip them. Then they say, evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Well, now they're down to what I believe in. I believe species can change. But I believe the changes are limited. See, this is a lie, folks. That's not really what they mean by evolution. They want to suck the kids into believing in evolution by showing them an example of a little variation and then say, see, that proves the whole theory. Oh, <laughs> it does not. It doesn't prove a thing. It proves dogs produce dogs, sometimes big, sometimes little, but dogs. All the evidence they give for evolution has been proven wrong years ago. Here's a textbook. Evidence from fossils. That's sheer baloney. No fossil counts. You don't know that that bone had any kids. Try that in a court of law and a freshman law student will tear you apart on that one. Okay? Evidence from structure, molecular biology, evidence from development. Oh, everything they do has been proven wrong. There's no scientific evidence to support this theory except things that have been proven wrong years ago. Now, if real evidence for the theory exists, then please show me. But don't keep spreading lies as if you've got some evidence for your theory. There isn't any. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they assume mutations will make something new and better. That's never been observed. Secondly, they assume natural selection makes it survive. See, in order for evolution to work, one animal has to evolve a little better than the rest. Now, what must happen to the rest of them to make this work? They got to die. Evolution's a religion of death, not a religion of life. According to evolution, death brought man into the world. According to the Bible, man brought death into the world. Totally opposite. Somebody's wrong, folks. Seriously wrong. This textbook talks about mutations. And it says, mutations are the original source of variation in populations. I agree. Probably all the roses in the world today had a common ancestor. A uh, rose. <laughs> mutations do not produce evolution. Nearly all scientists agree with that. They just simply don't produce evolution. Here's a mutated bull. It's got five legs. There's no new information added. Here's a short-legged sheep, short sheep. That's a mutant. No new information is added. He lost some information. And he's the first one the wolf is going to catch. There's a two-headed turtle. That's mutant. It's not ninja, but it's mutant, okay? <laughs> now, he's going to freeze first winter. Nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. Hmm? They don't? Okay. Uh, scrambling up letters from the word Christmas will get you all sorts of different words, but you will never get Xerox out of Christmas. The letters aren't available. And scrambling up an existing gene code, which is what a mutation does, does not give you some new, improved information. It doesn't do it. This textbook shows the kids a four-wing fly. And it says, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four, and by the way, it cannot fly. It says, this rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Now watch this. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, excuse me, why didn't they show us a beneficial mutation? Why did they show us a bad one and tell us about the good ones? Show me a good one. There's never been one. One professor said, oh, there's a good mutation. People in Africa that get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. I said, well, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot, you know? <laughs> that's just brilliant. They tell the kids, evolution and natural selection go together. This one says, evolution, natural selection causes evolution. Oh, come on. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. Here's the world's smallest horse. Pretty tiny. Useless. Doesn't bark. I mean, what, what good is it, you know? Um, natural selection does not create how people got this crazy idea that natural selection is a creative force, I don't know, but it's not. It doesn't create a thing. It just simply selects. It's a quality control. And if we had time, we'd get into a lot more of that. Quality control does not change the car to an airplane if you select all the bad cars. Okay? Everything in nature was designed. And uh, if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but there is a designer, and we're going to all stand before him one of these days, maybe pretty soon. Thank you so much.
have your dribblers come through. You start playing a clipboard. Uh, if we have your contact information, just send you some more information about upcoming events. That's all purpose of it. So that'll be coming around, okay? Let's we'll start that around, guys. Okay, Dr. Trevor. Before I turn to genetics, I want to make a few comments on what we've just heard here and the level of honesty of the person making these comments. Because this is someone who feels free to call other people liars and to use the word lie uh, about uh, a whole set of people and a whole set of activities. Uh, yet he uh, uh, has some vulnerability on exactly that subject. Let's just deal with trivia first of all. Symbiosis requires simultaneous creation. That's nonsense. We have many numerous studies of symbioses beginning and in some cases symbioses breaking down and you don't have to imagine simultaneously everything's in place in order to get it to evolve. That's an elementary error that's been around in some forms for over a hundred years. He claims that evolutionary theory is not science but is religion because science, he says, is derived from observation and study and since you can't actually observe a fossil change into a different fossil, then therefore your discussions on what you assume happened is religious. That's nonsense again. There are all kinds of observations you make um, and studies you make that lead to inferences and conclusions from which you can derive uh, a given result. So that's fatuous that we're talking about opposing religious schools. Um, now, regarding his uh, infatuation with the term liar, I urge on you two uh, websites that you can go to if you want a deeper knowledge of this. One is www.talkorigins.org and that'll deal with very detailed refutations of the bizarre story he's peddling about how uh, this universe came about. There is one that may appeal to some of you in this audience even more. It's called AnswersInGenesis.org. It is an explicitly Christian uh, website. But it has a subsection called Arguments Creationists Should Not Use and this is devoted to arguments that this character has used in the past and that are recognized as being uh, dishonest in content and almost certainly uh, dishonest in intent, including various kinds of lies he's told about Darwin's deathbed conversion, about uh, Thomas Henry Huxley talking about free sex, a basking shark found off of Japan really being a plesiosaur and so forth and so on. I don't have the time to deal with this kind of trivia, but I urge you, if you've got an interest in a slightly more mature Christian uh, creationist approach, to check answers in Genesis, or if you're interested in the evidence more broadly, to check talkorigins.org. Um, All evidence has been proven fraudulent. Everything has been disproven. Nonsense. This is spontaneous generation, he claims. Again, nonsense. Spontaneous generation was a notion that you could get a frog appearing out of nowhere. Uh, mutations never make things better. Now, that's a lie. We have many examples of mutations that are beneficial, including, for that matter, the mutation that in heterozygous form, that's where you have one of them and you don't have the other, provides you with protection from malaria. A mutation that is disproportionately uh, present in African American people derived from an area that was high in malaria. And then he repeats an old, old canard, natural selection does not create, it only destroys, it only selects. Natural selection is a continual selective process, but it moves the frequency distribution of genes beyond the distribution that existed when it started, and it can create brand new creations relatively quickly that have never existed before. It's elementary. Now let me go back to talking about genetics for a second, because this is a second kind of uh, another kind of problem you get into when you just invent something out of whole cloth and imagine that it's going to fly. 
If you've got an ark full of two of each kind and only maybe 10 human beings, we know for sure they're going to have to practice inbreeding for a number of generations. Because you only got two individuals, let's hope it's male and female, the offspring have got to breed among themselves, the grandchildren have got to breed among themselves, the great grand offspring have got to breed among themselves because there ain't any other individuals around. We know, and it's an elementary calculation, that it takes about seven generations to wipe out all genetic variability. Now, this level of inbreeding imposed on all organi or organisms has destroyed. It's destructive in the way he moans and groans about uh, natural selection. It destroys uh, genetic variability, and it destroys knowledge. Now, um, 6,000 years ago, this all happened, according to him. That's about 200 generations since then. We have plenty of good observations through study that in humans, you accrue roughly a new mutation per generation. So each of you in here can be happy that you're a mutant to some uh, fair probability. Now, if you allow 200 generations, then we can allow the accumulation of 200 new uh, mutations. Uh, during that period of time. That would lead to 40,000 of your genes, only 200 of them would show variability due to a new mutation. In fact, out of our 40,000 genes, 4,000 of them show genetic variability. How can you generate this consistent with his hypothesis? Well, again, you'd have to invent some ad hoc hypothesis. You'd have to say, well, for reasons unknown to us and without any evidence for it whatsoever and inconsistent with everything we know about current life, there was a rain of mutations that struck not just humans but struck all other creatures as well. And then you think, oh, well, I've gotten myself out of that. Yes, I've got to imagine another absurdity, but fine, I'm out of the immediate bind. But it ain't that easy. Because if uh, the individuals are accruing mutations rapidly over this short period of time, they all trace back to the ancestral group 6,000 years ago. So as we like to say, everything comes back as spokes on a wheel instead of trees where some individuals are more related to others and some groups are more related to others, some share more variants uh, with some individuals than others. If you apply this to, um, um, well, there's a worse problem still, which I'll go over in, in two minutes' time. I don't want to introduce too much uh, science into this revival meeting, but I want to introduce a little bit. <laughs> the, genetic, the genetic code is redundant. That is, there's some uh, codes that code for the same amino acid. So you can get a mutation from one code there to the other, still produces the same protein, still the identical same individual. We, uh, we don't think natural selection acts on those genes or acts extremely weakly because it produces the same individual. Now those change over time due to random processes, and these have been studied in some depth in the lab, and they fit logic. Uh, and they start to diverge from each other solely because of random uh, factors. Some individuals breed, some don't, and so some variants, which are coding for the same thing, become more frequent and others less frequent. They evolve by a random walk. Well, the interesting thing about random walks is that they tell time, because the longer the time for the walk, the further apart two originally identical molecules are going to become at these synonymous sites. Now, two things uh, 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 can be concluded from a world of data on these synonymous sites. Uh, first of all, they provide a congruent system of dating, which is congruent with the strata and the phylogeny. That's a very curious fact that didn't get explained by his fantasy about uh, sorting by size uh, during the flood. Uh, how is it that individuals that are further down uh, show greater divergence due to random walk at these synonymous sites? And the second thing that's interesting about these data is if you are given an anchor point, that is one point in time in the past, whose actual time you know, not relative time, but like it's, uh, you dated from the methods I was telling you, geological clocks, you said it's 200 million years. Then you can use all of the data 
on synonymous sites since then to give exact times to the splits of other species. And you can check them both against the geological record and against the timing. And once again, it's congruent. I'm thinking of forming an organization called Liars for Jesus. I'm willing to lie for my Lord. That's right. I'm willing to lie for Jesus. I'm willing to pillory people whose work I, I, I do not uh, study or understand. I'm willing to make a fraudulent uh, challenge, my quarter million dollar challenge. I'm willing to uh, make just flat assertions about what's known or what isn't known in a vast scientific enterprise that's occupied the serious attention of serious people, uh, over hundreds of thousands of them, up to a million scientists working on this over the years. And I hope Mr. Hoven will be uh, honorary president of the organization that maybe I can find a role in it for Mr. Guarneri as well. I just want to end by saying that one of the most disturbing aspects of, of this and, and a sense of the uh, uh, orientation of many of you is that I regard the religion that's being pushed as being almost as bad as the anti-science. I think he's giving you a double bad deal. He ain't giving you no science, and he's misrepresenting that. And the religion he's selling you, to me, is infantile. It's arrogant and blasphemous to tell God how creation occurred, how God created this earth. How dare he? And reducing God to an anthropocentric midget, the, the, the organism that created this vast universe is just this trivial creature running things uh, for the benefit of uh, humans and a particular group of humans right now. I think it's pathetic. Jesus warned against those who would come in his name as false prophets, who would, who would come crying in his name, and he, and he said, beware of them. Judge them by their fruits, he said. And what are the fruits of this man's work? Misrepresentation, lies, and an absurd fantasy of a flood based on a hellish vision of what the creator is really like. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, well, I stick by my guns. I'll try to answer as many questions as I can in a moment. But the evidence that is used to support the evolution theory is indeed lies and has been proven wrong. For example, your textbook will tell you that the appendix is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's a lie been proven wrong years ago. The appendix is part of your immune system. If your appendix is taken out, you can still live. There's no question about that. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes also. That doesn't prove you don't need it. The appendix, oh, I've got the wrong remote. Here's the problem. The appendix is part of the immune system. Anybody that studies biology or anatomy should understand that. Uh, see, there we go. You take your appendix out, you've got a better chance of getting quite a few diseases. Sometimes that's the best option, but the appendix is not vestigial. That should not be used as evidence for evolution. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. The National Center for Science Education in Berkeley, this little storefront building, says that Bossy evolved a blowhole this is how whales evolved, according to the National Center, whose, who, whose whole purpose is to keep creation out of schools, to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. This was started by Andrew Carnegie with a grant because he loved the evolution theory and gave a bunch of money to support the evolution theory in schools. This textbook again says the whale has a pelvis right here. The whales have a pelvis, vestigial pelvis, that serve no purpose. Whales have hind limb bones that have no function, this textbook says. Just imagine whales walking around, it's true. These are the bones they're talking about right there. These little bones 
are supposed to let us imagine that the whale used to walk around. <laughs> now, this one says the whale has no, pel pelvis has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. Now, this is simply a lie. Those bones are part of the whale's reproductive system. The male and female bones have, w whales have different bones there. Whales are pretty big, and that's part of the reproductive system. It has nothing to do with walking on land and never did. Okay? Here's a 15 and a half foot python snake skin I have in my museum. You can see if you look down near the anterior end, it has little tiny claws right there. One here and one here, attached to a little tiny bone that goes up inside the snake's body. Now the textbook says, rudimentary hind legs of a python snake are supposed to be evidence for evolution. Those are not rudimentary hind legs. Those are used in mating. The snake can't talk, he can't say scoot over honey, and he doesn't have any arms, okay? This has nothing to do with a snake walking on land. They're so desperate for evidence for evolution that this becomes evidence for evolution. And it's not. Don't tell that to the kids. This one says humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use, and this is part of the evidence for evolution. The vestigial tailbone in humans is homologous to the functional tail in other primates. Thus, vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. I tell people, look, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. There are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need that tailbone. This guy says the coccyx, at the small bone at the human, end of the human vertebral column, it has no present function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. That is simply a lie, folks. It is not true. Why, they, why do we allow the kids teach, teachers to teach that stuff? I don't know. Let me get to a few of the... Uh, what happened here? Oh, here we go. A few of the rebuttal thing here. Let's see. Oh, went too far. Um, here we go. No, wrong one. There, some points made. He said evolution is supported by an overwhelming number of scientists. The majority opinion means nothing in any argument, okay? The majority opinion can think the world's flat and can think that, you know, if you take your blood out, you get better. And the majority for 2,000 years thought big rocks fall faster than little rocks. And it's not true. They thought the planets go around the Earth. And that's not true. Fossils are the key subject. There's a huge number of fossils that have been found. I agree. But none proving evolution. Fossils exist in the present. You can put an interpretation on them if you want, which is what happens with the evolution theory. 99% of the species are extinct. I don't know if that figure is correct or not. That depends on how you want to look at it. But still, that's the opposite of evolution. Extinction is the opposite of what you need. You need lots of new ones coming on. They're not organized, by the way, clearly, like as we see later. Simpler, simpler creatures are lower in the fossil record. That's simply not true. All sorts of animals are found in all sorts of layers. Okay? There's quite a mixing of the fossil record. Carbon dating is good for 50,000 years. Uh, well, carbon dating is uh, fatally flawed. We covered that for an hour on video number seven. He said some of the people in Darwin's time said there were 20 separate creations. Darwin did indeed properly argue against a false teaching that was going around in his day. I don't teach that. This is a straw man, okay? I don't know any creation, creationists today that teach that. There were some people in Darwin's time who said, if there are 20 kinds of birds, then God must have made 20 kinds of birds. 20 kinds of finches, or 14, whatever it was. Darwin was correct to try to refute that particular false teaching. But nobody today's taught, nobody's taught that for over 100 years. So to bring this up now is a straw man, okay? It's not being taught. I, don't, I never have taught that. Did Noah allow, no, he said Noah did not allow dinosaurs in the ark. He discriminated against them. That's not true. I said earlier, Noah did have dinosaurs on the ark. I believe he took reptiles, which are, uh, dinosaur means terrible lizard. It's what the word means. How much rain to cover the world? To take it 11 inches per hour. This is another straw man argument. He's assuming that all the rain comes from, the, all the water comes from rain, number one. The Bible doesn't say that. It says the fountains of the deep broke open. Most of the water came from inside the earth. Secondly, you don't have to cover Mount Everest. Mount Everest wasn't there. The Bible says in Psalm 104, after the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, and the water rushed off. I don't know how much rain there was, but it didn't have to get... He set up a whole straw man and said, well, take 11 inches per hour, and that will produce X number of thousand calories and all that kind of stuff, the um, two to 6,000 degrees, and it would cook everything. This is setting up a straw man and attacking it. I don't know anybody that says that, and in the creationist viewpoint, most of the water came from inside when the fountains of the deep broke open, and that's why we have all the fault lines today. The earth is busted up into plates. He said he's looked at fossil footprints that are three and a half million years old. They're like ours, but they're smaller. Well, if you find put footprints that are like ours... What should you conclude? Uh, a human walk there, maybe. A lot of people studied those footprints in Lake Tolly and said, boy, if we didn't know they were so old, we'd think, so, we'd think a human walked here. One professor studied it. He studied 70 people that go barefoot all their life in some village out in Africa someplace. They never wear shoes, ever. And he said their footprints that they make are exactly like the ones in Lake Tolly. 
Okay, well, you found some footprints fossilized in the ash. They're assuming they're three and a half million years old. That's baloney. They're not three and a half million years old. Nothing is. He said marsupial creatures are found in Australia. I agree. Marsupials tend to be less aggressive. I've been to Australia. You can walk up to the koalas and they'll, you know, pick them up and they're cuddly to some extent. I think after the flood was over, when the animals got off the ark, the less aggressive ones would continually be driven to the fringe by the more aggressive ones. And then as the water slowly came up as the ice caps melted. I believe the ice caps probably lasted 200 years after the flood. If, the, if there was ice caps clear down to Kansas City, Missouri, the oceans would be lower by a few hundred feet. And now you can actually walk any place in the world. There are underwater land bridges everywhere. Between, Alas between Australia and Vietnam, the water is 50 or 60 feet deep. Between Russia and uh, Alaska, the water is 60 feet deep. The English Channel, the deepest point in the English Channel is 150 feet from here to that back wall. I mean, it's not like we look at the ocean and say, wow, it's deep, you know, it's blue, it must be deep. No, there's a lot of real shallow parts. So I think by just having larger ice caps during the flood and after the flood, there would be lower ocean levels connecting all the continents. The kangaroos had probably a couple hundred years to walk or migrate to Australia, and it just happened as the ice was melting back and the water's rising, they ended up trapped. That's a much more logical explanation than to say kangaroos came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. He said he wants to replace a coherent, logical story. Evolution is not coherent nor logical. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. Based on millions of pieces of evidence, I would like to see the best evidence anybody has. Just show me the best one anybody knows of for evolution. Bring that up during Q&A, please. Level of honesty. Uh, yes, I think if somebody uses information that's been proven wrong years ago, they're liars. Ernst Haeckel said that the embryo growing in the mother has gill slits. That was proven wrong in 1874. Anybody that knows their biology knows that embryos do not have gill slits. So don't tell people they do. They're lying to tell them they do. Symbiosis can evolve. Well, you can dream about that. It depends on, I guess, how, how intensive a level of symbiosis you want. Evolution is a religion. I inferences and conclusions drawn from fossils. Again, fossils don't count. Answers in Genesis. I am good friends with Ken Ham. I love his ministry. I sell his books. I link to his site. He doesn't like me for some reason. That's fine. The, and I, he said, I use arguments that are dishonest. For instance, Darwin's deathbed conversion. I have never used that. I defy anybody to show me any time in my seminar where I've used that. D Answers in Genesis is correct. That argument should not be used. His wife, Darwin's wife, apparently made up the whole story about him converting on his deathbed. The story's not true, and I don't use that. As far as Huxley and his morals, well, let me show you what Huxley said. Since I get accused all the time of, uh, oh, oh, hang on here. Let's, uh, Huxley said in, uh, now, it is correct that I had, uh, the wrong Huxley. I said Thomas Huxley. It was actually his grandson. Um, grandson Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason why we leapt at the origin of species was that the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. He said that on a television interview. Uh, Julian Huxley, the head of UNESCO. He said the reason we like this evolution theory is because it interfered with our sexual mores. We don't want God telling us thou shalt not commit adultery. Professor Ruse, Michael Ruse, University of Guelph said, Evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity and with meaning and morality. I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian, but I must admit that this is but one complaint, and Mr. Gish is but one, one of many to make it. The illiteralists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. Uh, Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to Darwin's 100-year anniversary book, uh, anniversary publication, said... Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. Uh, Professor uh, Louis Bonheur said, evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Malcolm Muggeridge said, I'm convinced the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Evolution is a dying religion. And all religions die hard. I mean, when they, pay, when they burn people at the stake for daring to suggest the Earth was not the center of the solar system. And as evolution slowly dies in our culture, you're going to see real vehement attacks. I mean, people get fired from universities like this for daring to question evolution. It's a dying religion, folks. You ought to get off the bandwagon, okay? Evolution, scientists who go about claiming evolution is a fact of life are great con men. The story they are telling is the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. Fred Hoyle, famous astronomer from Europe, said the only way life could have come into existence is because some superintelligence having created it. Well, we could talk for hours on this one. Let me get back to where we were if we got a few seconds left here. Okay. Um.
Let's see. And get to where we were. All evidence has been proven wrong. I stick by my guns. There are no beneficial mutations. But it looks to me like he wants it both ways here. He wants to say seven generations of inbreeding will wipe out the variability. And then he turns it around and says, there's not enough time to get all these variations we have. I think he's arguing out of both sides of his mouth there. Oh. Um, I cover, let's see. I did not get into um, some uh, levels of uh, some other, <laughs> some other examples of lies in the textbooks that are used to support the evolution theory. How much time? Textbooks tell the kids that the horse evolved from a four-toed horse, okay? This biology book admits this much, uh, included much repeated gradual evolution of the modern horse has not held up to close examination. Fifty years ago, G.G. Simpson, a very famous brand name evolutionist, said, the evolution of the horse family was unintentionally falsified. It's been proven for 50 years, the horse story that's in your textbooks is not true. But they're still teaching it. Simpson said, the uniform continuous transformation of the, of the horse series, basically, did never happen in nature. But they say, they have evidence. This is one of the best evidences used for evolution. Darwin considered this the best piece of evidence for his theory. He said, the embryo growing in a human has, has gills. This textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows that these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. They want you to think that's a gills like a fish? That's simply a lie, folks. That's been proven wrong 128 years ago. Those are not gills. Those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <laughs> this is simply a lie. Haeckel read Darwin's book the year after it came out when it was translated to German, and Haeckel said, wow, what a great theory. This gets rid of God. If only we had some evidence for this theory. And Ernst Haeckel, an embryology professor at the University of Jena in Germany, lied. He took a drawing of a dog and a human, and he faked, he lied, he changed him, he made them look alike. Here are the actual drawings. These are his fake drawings. He changed all sorts of things to make them look alike. Haeckel made giant charts of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and held seminars on why everybody should believe in evolution. Actually, here are Haeckel's drawings compared to actual photographs taken a couple years ago. He lied. My point is, this is still being used in textbooks today as evidence for evolution. I care. I think some other people care too. Get the lies out of our books. My point is, if you have some evidence for evolution, then show me. But don't lie to the kids. Don't tell them the embryo. Officer, if you can keep it in, in line, please, okay? I don't want to have to uh, uh, waste, up my, waste my time. Uh, we'll be glad to take questions, okay? But uh, grow up a little bit. Wait your turn, okay? This is simply a lie, but it's used in textbooks all over the world. It was proven wrong in 1874. Here it is in a 94 textbook. Here another 94 textbook. Here's Tim Barra still teaching it. Ken Miller still teaching it in a 1998 textbook. I could talk for hours. I debated Ken Miller. Here's a 98 textbook used in Pensacola, Florida, still teaching the same lie. This one shows, says, as they suggest evolution from a common ancestor because of the presence of gills. This is simply not true. Here's a 2001 textbook used for junior high saying that the similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor. Now look, that's not true. They don't provide such evidence. But the books teach this over and over and over. It's in books. I've been to 30 countries in all 49 states. It's in books all over the world, folks. They're teaching the same thing. They're saying it's not a human yet. It's a human at conception. Every doctor knows that. They teach it doesn't have gill slits. This is baloney. So if you have evidence for evolution, show me. But don't lie to these kids. Come on. We can go for hours and hours on lies in the textbooks. All I want is very simple. Get the lies out of the books. Then the books will be fine. There's a lot of good science in the books. We're not against science. But we're against supporting a lousy theory with false ideas, that's all. Let's just teach the truth. Teach science to the kids, and I think you'll find evolution will have to slowly slip through the cracks, and that's what they're really worried about. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question and answer time now, and... Uh Dr. Trevor is going to receive the first question. 
Uh, he's going to have about two minutes. We're not going to hold him real tight to that, but we're about two minutes to answer the question, to, to finish, finish responding, or if you respond sooner, that's fine. And then uh, Dr. Hoven's going to have an opportunity to comment on that, and uh, then we'll go back and forth and uh, for approximately a half hour for the question and answer uh, period. So I hope your question gets in, but obviously we couldn't get all the questions. There must be like 100 questions there. So, all right. I'm going to get this microphone. Thank you. I'm going to give the question, the question, questioners. Our first question will be for Dr. Trivers. Dr. Trivers? How would you explain fossilized clams on top of Mount Everest? Oh, I see. Okay, now it's working. Uh, question is, uh, how would I explain fossilized plants on Mount Everest? And assuming there are fossilized plants on Mount Everest, I wouldn't have any great difficulty. What's that? What did I say? Fossilized clams. What did I say? Huh? Yeah, what did I say? It's clams we're talking about? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so that we're all on the same page, the question has to do with fossilized clams, not plants on Mount Everest. And I say, assuming that such exist, uh, then I'd have to understand the geological history of the mountain. If you're a recent creationist, it all happened 6,000 years ago, and everything else is a lie, then mountains haven't changed an awful lot, except for this enormous scouring of water that took place in this deluge, unless you believe another fantasy that the water was hidden away inside and popped out, or another fantasy of Dr. Uh, Hovind's that it all came in a, a meteor uh, with water until it was shown that that would be vaporized. It's well known that mountains rise uh, through the tectonic uh, forces that are generated by tectonic plates. So I'll, I'll just switch it. I don't know Mount Everest, never been there. Uh, but I have spent a lot of time in Jamaica, and it is well known that the mountain in Jamaica, uh, which is 7,600 feet, was, uh, uh, came up. Uh, from the ocean. On my own property that's about 2,000 feet up, not on a mountainside, you can find uh, limestone, which of course is, is being generated um, um, by uh, living creatures in coral reefs, and within the limestone you can find clams and other kinds of marine creatures, and in some cases you can find ones that don't exist now. In fact, if you study the whole structure of the area I live in, you see repeated areas of limestone, uh, just as you would expect if the earth was rising. And as it first comes above the water, you've got these coral reefs forming. And then as it continues to rise, those coral reefs are above water. They dry out and uh, become limestone. Thank you. Dr. Holden? OK. Here's a public school textbook saying climbers reaching the top of Mount Everest plant their victory flags over the remains of animals that once lived in the sea. It's a simple fact that the top 3,000 feet of Mount Everest is indeed full of sedimentary rock loaded with seashells. Here's an article from the paper uh, last year, two years ago. Um, paleontologist, whatever his name is here, rests on a giant fossil oyster found in Peru. Uh, more than 500 giant fossil oysters were found two miles above sea level some of which are 11 and a half feet wide and 661 pounds. Well, interesting, these oysters are in the closed position. Petrified clams in the closed position are found all over the world, including the top Mount Everest. Now, when a clam dies, it opens. You can walk along the beach and find a billion seashells. You hardly ever find a matched pair, and you don't find them closed if they're dead. They open, the muscle relaxes, it's just a natural response. So I think the best explanation of petrified clams, and sometimes they're found up to 10 feet thick, solid petrified clams, jammed in there, closed and petrified. To me, it's not a problem. The 
flood would have underwater what are called turbidity currents, mudslides underwater move incredibly fast. There was one turbidity current that cut the transatlantic cable years ago. They said it had to move 70 miles an hour underwater, the mud flow. I think during the flood in the days of Noah, you would get incredible turbidity currents that would bury beds of clams, and when they wake up dead, they can't open. And so they end up getting petrified. And then the Bible says in Psalm 104, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, and uh, the petrified clams on top of Mount Everest are absolutely no problem for my worldview. Next question is for Ken Hoven, Dr. Ken Hoven. Please explain the assumptions in carbon-14 dating. I have about, so, who knows, five or six or 7,000 slides in my presentation. So it would really help if you ask the questions in the same order that I have the same in the answers, you know. <laughs> uh, carbon dating is based on quite a few obvious assumptions. Um, I'll give you a quick analogy. I covered this for an hour on video number seven, if you want to get the good detail. If I asked you to fill a barrel with water, but I had drilled holes in the barrel, while you're filling it, it's leaking. At some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You can't fill it past that point unless you speed up the intake or cut down the outgo. The atmosphere is receiving carbon-14. It's actually being manufactured by radiation striking nitrogen, and it's turning it into carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope, unstable, lasts 5,730 years, according to most uh, scientists. Well, at some point, the Earth's atmosphere would have to reach equilibrium. If, if you just created a brand new planet Earth, stuck it out there, poof, got it spinning around the sun. Willard Libby did quite a bit of study on this. He invented carbon dating. And they said it would take about 30,000 years for the atmosphere to reach equilibrium. In other words, it's create, being created and being destroyed simultaneously. So within 30,000 years, the atmosphere would equalize. Then Willard Libby said, well, we know the Earth is millions of years old. Mistake number one. Therefore, we can ignore the equilibrium problem. Mistake number two. Earth's atmosphere has still not reached equilibrium. Radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying. Carbon dating is an excellent proof the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, probably much less than 30,000 years old. Uh, when you go to date animals to test their age with carbon dating, you get really wild numbers. I don't have time to go through all the other assumptions based on like the rate of burn, etc. Uh, but I can just give you a few examples showing you that it doesn't work. Living mollusk shells, carbon dated 2,300 years old. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. This guy said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Um, here's, uh, this guy says, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. The whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Here's one part of a mammoth, 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000. Same animal. That's a slow birth. 30 seconds. This, well, we could talk here a long time. Uh, geologic column. Uh, no, here's, okay. The lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old. The skin was 21,000. It just doesn't work. I'm sorry. It doesn't work. Thank you. Dr. Trivers. Yes, I'll just simply urge you who are interested in the latest set of lies from A Liar for Jesus, go to www.talkorigins.org, and that'll give you references also uh, to the literature that he's uh, very selectively and in some cases uh, grossly and accurately referring to. I don't have any more uh, to say about that. <laughs> Question for Dr. Trivers. As a scientist myself, I would like to hear evolution's explanation for trees that stick vertically up through many sedimentary layers that evolution says were deposited over millions of years. Uh, I don't know the phenomenon you're referring to. Fossil? Oh, oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. He doesn't know a phenomenon, but I'm honest. That's all I got to say. I don't know the phenomenon he's referring to. All right, I do understand the phenomena, and I'm honest too, and I resent being called a liar tonight. I'd like you to be specific if you have another lie. You give me one at a time, and I'll handle it. You're a liar 
liar when you say no one has found a single beneficial mutation. You're a liar when you're Dr. saying Dr. that someone Dr. with a beneficial mutation is related to someone else with a beneficial mutation. That's a specific example. We will. That's two examples. We will get back to that if time permits. Uh, I would like to this beneficial mutation. The textbooks will teach the kids that the layers of strata are different ages. This is taught uniformly all over the world that the layers are different ages. And yet all over the world, in Germany, France, British Isles, Nova Scotia, California, and several eastern states, petrified trees are found in the vertical position running through multiple rock layers. Yellowstone has 27 consecutive layers of these trees at Specimen Ridge. Standing trees in the petrified, petrified trees in the standing position running through multiple rock layers is proof positive the layers are not millions of years different in age. In central Alabama, there's a large coal field right there. You can talk to Dr. McDonald, who's a geologist who works there in that coal field, and he will show you dozens of petrified trees that were found standing up running through multiple rock layers. The kids have been taught for years that the Blue Creek and the Mary Lee Formation are different ages, and yet when you put all the fossils together, you get sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you can prove positively those layers formed quickly. Uh, petrified trees 30 feet tall found in Cookville, Tennessee, standing up. Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for its petrified trees in the vertical position. They're called polystrata fossils. Why students are taught, why people are allowed to teach that each of those rock strata are a different age, I don't know, but they are not. It is not common sense. Um, sometimes the trees are upside down running through many rock layers. Well, who they did? are not, the rock layers are not different ages, but the whole theory of evolution rests on the assumption that the geologic column is accurate. And that was proven, that was developed by Charles Lyell and others back in the 1830s, way before there ever was a carbon dating, ethnium argon dating, or iridium strontium dating, or any other thing else. Okay? Okay, next. Next question is for Dr. Hoven. The Avimimus is a bird-like dinosaur that supposedly had feathers. How would you discount this as traditional, uh, transitional proof for evolution from reptiles to birds? Okay, the question, did dinosaurs become birds? Uh, the Bible says God made the fowl on day five, he made the reptiles on day six. Evolution theory is exactly the opposite. Reptiles came first and then birds. This guy says scientists are dinosaurs are alive as birds. It's absurd. Uh, 99, the National or USA Today published an article about the missing link was discovered. National Geographic, the missing link, breaking news, we found the proof for evolution. Had a big article about it in November 99. Two months later, oops, it was a fraud. Somebody, some guy in China made this thing and sold it to the Americans for a lot of money. Proven wrong, we could go spend a long time on this one if you'd like, on this. Uh, dinosaurs, the birds, the descendants of dinosaurs. All you gotta do is add a few feathers and say, man, it, go ahead, it won't hurt too much. Give it a try, okay? <laughs> there are millions of differences. Uh, Alan Fiducia is probably one of the world's experts on birds. He believes in evolution strongly, UNC Chapel Hill. He said, uh, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not, it's a bird, it's a perching bird. Archaeopteryx, uh, had claws on its wings, and they say that's a missing link. We don't have time to cover all this today, but there's an awful lot of evidence that uh, the one you mentioned here, uh, I think I have stuff on that one too. I have most of the things in here. Um, Archaeopteryx, and none of these can be missing links, fully formed birds are found in rock layers dated by the evolutionists at 130 million years old. How could they evolve from dinosaurs? Dinosaurs lived and died, according to their theory, 65 million years ago. Here's 140 million year old birds found, much older than Archaeopteryx. Fossil remains of a bird 142 to 137 million years old, uh, so it could not possibly be a descendant. Uh, this guy, Fiducia, says, uh, I'm sorry, Geo Times 96 model, uh, says there are plenty of other reasons to refute the dinosaur bird connection, says Fiducia. How do you derive birds from a heavy earthbound bipedal reptile that has a deep body, a heavy balancing tail, and four shortened limbs? He said, biophysically, it's impossible. Lungs are totally different. Modern birds are found in layers lower than and with the dinosaurs. Scales and feathers attach differently to the body. They come from different genes on the chromosomes. Birds have a four-chambered heart. Most reptiles have three. Birds lay a calcium-covered egg. Reptiles lay generally a leather egg. There simply is no fossil evidence of how a reptile changed to a bird. Now, if you want to believe that, you just enjoy yourself. But that's a religion. Keep it out of our schools, please. Question for Dr. Hoven. The 24-hour day is based on the Earth's, rotation, Earth's orbit around the sun. So how can the first couple of days be 24 hours if the sun and the moon weren't created until the fourth day. 
Good question. I think uh, the Bible says that God is light, and it says he made light first, and our day starts at midnight when the sun's not even out. One spin of the earth is a day on earth in relation to anything. You could have a day, you could have the earth spinning in relation to anything, you know. It's, and we happened to, we started at midnight, like I said. So later in Exodus chapter 20, God told his people that I want you to honor the Sabbath because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And same thing in Exodus 31. Here we have clear examples where God lumped all six days together as if they're the same. The sun wasn't there till day three, or day four, I understand. But there was light before that, and the earth apparently was spinning before that in relation to that light. Uh, that would be a real minor question or problem compared to the evolutionist problem that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, in my opinion. Um, I'll say two things. The, the, the answer to that question is too trivial to go into. Uh, it's a good question. We measure a day a certain way. Days didn't appear in that form till four days into this story. The story is a metaphor. It's not a, hey, they, they were really 24 hours and you can take it to the bank. Um, if that kind of argumentation uh, satisfies you that, oh, well, there was light and somehow the earth was spinning even before it was created to spin, fine. Uh, I don't have anything to say about it. I just want to go back one step. I do not believe that uh, Mr. Hoven knows what a mutation is because he's now shifted his criteria. Now a mutation is something that's, that suddenly in one jump takes you from this species to a brand new species. That's why he's got to have individuals with two mutations matching because that's the only way Mr. Hoven can imagine uh, two new species uh, arriving. Just like everything has to happen in an instant in creation, just like the whole uh, paleontological record has to be wrought in a, in a few months of this horrendous flood he's describing, so his only image, his blinkered image of how you can get a new species from another species is a single event in a single generation. Um, I mean, there are a whole bunch of biology courses, which I'm happy to know your children will be taking, that'll, exp <laughs> that'll, that'll explain, to them, explain to them how that works. I think that was my response to him. Let's make this the last. Uh... Question for Dr. Chivers. Yes, sir. Explain the evolution of a feather. Explain the evolution of a feather. From the scales of reptiles. Well, I just happened to have spent several months working on this problem. Um, how am I supposed to explain the evolution of a feather? Well, it is uncertain how feathers evolved or what their initial function was. It was initially believed they evolved for flight. Uh, it later seemed more logical, and there was, again, some fossil evidence that was consistent with it, that they may have evolved for thermoregulation and later achieved uh, a role in flight. They're believed to have evolved from scales of a reptile, and I'm not a bird anatomist, and I've not spent my life concerning myself with every single detail of every single creature, including, in particular, the details as to how feathers evolved. All right. Uh. <clears throat> This biology book says very clearly, bird feathers evolved from the same scales that protected the reptiles so well. Bird feathers are unbelievably complex. Um, feathers and scales are both made of the protein keratin, but that proves a common design engineer, not a common ancestor. Battleships and forks are both made from iron. It doesn't prove one evolved from a tin can. That proves iron is a good substance with which to make things, okay? And the designer used keratin to cre create all kinds of things. Uh, 1996, uh, Journal of Evolutionary Biology, uh, volume 9, page 140. Ooh, ooh, hang on. At the morphological level, feathers are traditionally considered homologous with reptilian scales. However, in development, morphogesis, gene structure, protein shape, and sequence, and filament formation, and structure feathers are different. Clearly, feathers provide a unique and outstanding example of evolutionary novelty. Now, the guy still believes in evolution. We'll try to fix that. But he says, 
they are unique. They did not evolve from scales. It's just, they're just too different. If somebody wants to believe they did, that's perfectly fine. And if you go back and listen to the tape, you'll see several times he said, well, we believe it might have happened or, you know, could have happened or something like that. That's fine. I don't care if what you believe. It's not science. It's a religion. Face it. Admit it. It's a religion. If you want to believe that, great. You teach that at your, your expense to your kids. Don't teach that at my expense to my kids. That's all. Thank you. His turn over here. This will be our last question for Dr. Hoven. If creationists believe the universe was created 6,000 years ago, how do you explain the galaxies and stars, which are millions and billions of light years away? I don't know that I can do that in the time allotted. I will certainly try. Uh, we cannot tell the distance to stars beyond a few light years. So I'll show you the problems with that in a hurry here. I wish we had more time. I cover this in great detail on video number seven. Uh, let me get up to, uh, or if you watch, it's on my website too, a long answer to this. Stephen Hawking said, stars are so far away, all we see is a pinpoint of light. The biggest telescope looking at the closest star, all you see is a dot. To measure the distance to something you cannot touch, you have to use trigonometry. You have to know two angles and a side, or two sides and an angle. Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter, which is basically zero compared to star distance. So what they've done to enlarge the triangle is they look at the star in January and look at it in June, and now you have a 93 million mile radius on a circle, which is eight light minutes. So a 16 light minute diameter. A year has 525,000 minutes in it. So if you had two surveyors 16 inches apart looking at a dot eight and a third miles away, that's the ratio you have using Earth's orbit as the base looking at one light year. Uh, that makes an angle of 0 0.017 degrees. To measure 100 light years is clearly impossible. That's like two people in, Chica in uh, Pensacola on my roof 16 inches apart looking at a dot in Chicago. 15 billion years is clearly impossible. To, we just simply can't measure those distances. I don't, stars probably are billions of light years away. I don't know. Nobody does. Um, this textbook says you can measure 100 light years. Well, I doubt it, but I'll give them 100. So we don't know the distance to the stars. They could be billions of light years. We also have proven pretty cl conclusively here in the last 20 years that the speed of light is not a constant. At Harvard University in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. This was done at Harvard, Smithsonian, and Cambridge. That's what science is, something repeatable, observable, not hypothetical. At Princeton, meanwhile, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. The speed of light has decreased so rapidly over time that experimental error cannot explain it. Astronomer Barry Setterfield from Australia said, here's the chart showing the decline in the speed of light. If we had time, we'd talk about all that. The speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. Everything's documented at the bottom of the screen and on my website. The speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. According to the Big Bang Theory, the speed of light had to be faster. The speed of light may have changed over history, study says. A shocking possibility is the speed of light might, have, might change in time during the life of the universe. Now, 2002, August, uh, 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 um, Sydney, Australia, said the speed of, the light, speed of light may not be a constant. The speed, of, speed limit of the cosmos is being questioned. There's a new book out called Faster Than the Speed of Light. It's thirdly, I think that God created, made, made a mature creation. Adam and Eve were full grown. The trees were full grown. It has to be that way. You don't want to make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and give them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. Um, <laughs> It had to be mature. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. So if a star is 10 billion light years away, that's a distance. That's not a time. It's 10 billion light years. That's a distance. I don't know how they miss that. The speed of light is not proven to be consistent. So why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? God could have made it, you know, yesterday, if he wanted. I think he made it 6,000 years ago. Everything mature, fully formed, fully functioning. That's my answer. And how'd they say that on America? Uh, on, uh, that's my final answer. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, there is no doubt that the speed of light may have changed uh, over cosmological time. And it would be very difficult for us uh, with our present understanding, as I understand it, and I'm strictly an outsider on physics and cosmology, to prove or disprove uh, whether the speed of light has changed uh, over long, long periods of time. That it has been increased, the speed in Princeton, is an outright fabrication. You can go to this person and get him to give you the references and you can chase him down and see if anybody else in this state or anywhere else that has actual knowledge of the scientific work believes that someone has speeded up the speed of light by, what was it, a factor of 300, you said? 
I'll show you the reference. Uh, let's yeah. see. 300, I think you said. Uh, this will be. That's what the article said. Let's see. All right. Well, anyway. Here, New York Times, uh, May 30th, year 2000. So take it up with Mayor, what's his name from New York? Okay. <clears throat> this is the article just as it appeared on June 4th of the year 2000. Okay, well, uh, I suggest Dr. you go, Zhong Wang. Yeah, find, a, find a scientific journal and see if the conclusion is as described in there. Um, you know, I had one thought before I came over here, and this is the end of the question period, so this will be my last thought. I figured this man probably uses a computer. He probably uses light bulbs. He probably watches a television. He probably makes use of the enormous technological innovations that have come from the scrupulous, careful, detailed, and now centuries-long application of scientific reasoning to the universe around us. If you followed his style of approach broadly, not just, we want to teach our children uh, this and that, but took his style of approach towards reality, his uh, uh, assertions about the veracity of, of the work of other people and so on, you wouldn't come up with a calculator. You wouldn't come up with a ruler. You wouldn't come up with nothing like the computer that he's blessed to be able to use. Thank you. Dr. Trevor has had an opportunity for some closing comments. Dr. Hoven, some closing comments, please. Um, I certainly enjoy science. I have nothing against science, but the idea that uh, we wouldn't have computers if it weren't for evolution is simply ludicrous. Evolution has... <laughs> Almost... Don't, don't, use up my, don't use up my time here. Nearly all of the branches of science were started by creationists. It's the evolutionists that came along and, like a leech, began to suck the blood out of a valuable science over the last 20 years. Uh, nearly all branches of science were started by creationists, not by evolutionists. I defy you to find me one scientific advancement because of the theory of evolution. Uh, the evolution theory is useless. It's not only useless, it's dangerous. We teach the kids they're an animal and then wonder, why do they act like an animal? Well, duh. <laughs> They, all these are names of scientists who are believers in creation. So don't tell me that we wouldn't have a computer if it hadn't been for evolution. The guy who invented, like Maxwell, for instance, or uh, uh, Lord uh, Kelvin, and all these guys, all these guys are, were the shoulders that the giants were standing on, or the, the people were standing on the shoulders of giants. These are the giants they were standing on to create a computer. Somebody had to develop the transistor, and had to develop the circuitry, and printed circuitry. And these guys were creationists. These guys were believers in the Bible. They thought God created the world, and it's, it's man's duty to try to see how God did it and why he did it. Uh, I love science, and it is, it's a useless theory. It doesn't help us get a computer or go to the moon. There's no value to it whatsoever. And I resent the implication that scientists, all scientists believe in evolution, because they don't. The guy who invented the MRI is a creationist like me. There are thousands of scientists who are creationists. Many are indeed afraid of losing their job, because there's a real prejudice against those who don't believe, who don't bow down to the sacred cow. I mean, I'm sorry, here, let me find the right one here. I'll give you some examples here very quickly, since these are closing comments here, uh, uh, about uh, some scientists who were wrong in, in past. Uh, here, lots, lots of examples of that. Um, Dr. Robert Gentry did incredible research on the disposal of radioactive wastes at uh, Oak Ridge Laboratories in Knoxville, Tennessee. He was one of the world's experts on granites. He published in all the major magazines saying, look, the granites have these little tiny halos in them, radio polonium halos, indicating this rock was never hot. It forms too quickly. You can get his book or his website, uh, halos.com, if you want to get more on that. Roger DeHart was a science teacher in high school in Washington. He was told he could not tell his students about errors in the textbooks by passing out current science journals. You can't tell the kids there's a lie in your textbook. Kevin Haley, biology teacher at Central Oregon Community College, lost his job for simply exposing errors in the textbooks because that's a threat to the evolutionist. Baylor University fired William Dembski because he advocated there might be an intelligent designer that caused all this. Forrest Mims was a science writer for many years for many magazines. 
He was denied a job at Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. Rod Levesque in Minnesota uh, was reassigned just because he expressed doubt in Darwin's theory. Ta uh, teacher Dan Clark in Indiana was told by his superintendent that he could not introduce creationism to his class just simply by showing current science journals. Saying, look folks, it doesn't work. This is, this is the facts. Um, Dean Kenyon at San Francisco State University was the poster boy for evolutionists for years. He wrote all kinds of books about evolution. And then he made the tragic mistake of getting converted and they fired him. He sued and got his job back and now he's teaching again, but only because he was a tenured professor. If a professor stood up 20 years ago in the Soviet Union and said, kids, I don't think, capital, I don't think communism works. Capitalism's a better system. He'd lose his job or his life. We got the same censorship in America for somebody who dares to question the holy sacred cow of evolution. The students at, at Texas Tech University offered Dr. Denny $900 if he would debate me four weeks ago when I was there. He's the one who refuses to give um, recommendation letters to his students. He wouldn't take $900 to debate me for two hours. And yet he'll stand in front of his class where he's got the obvious academic and psychological advantage, but he won't take on a creationist who can answer his questions. Look, I, I fly all over the world. I'm willing, I, I do this at my expense. The church has sometimes taken an offering. I want to help. You students need to see both sides of this issue. Now, why so many professors are refu refuse or are reluctant to debate this, I don't know. I really appreciate this gentleman coming to do this. I think he's wrong and I'm going to get him converted, but uh, I'm glad he did it. So, I would say, I would say, these are my closing comments, I'm sorry. Uh, God created this world in six days, whether you like it or not, and you're going to stand before him and be judged by him one of these days, whether you like it or not. God created it, he owns it, he makes the rules, and we're going to stand before him. You better get ready for that day. Thank you. Dr. Hoven a few extra minutes and uh, we'd like to do the same for Dr. Trivers. I'm just going to comment, make two comments uh, on what he said and then make a third comment maybe. One is this fantasy he has that there are a huge number of scientists out there who are scared to come out of the closet and admit they're creationists because they're going to lose their jobs. One of the best protected institutions in this country is tenure, which says that after you've taught for six or eight years and you're accepted for tenure at a university, it's extremely hard to be kicked out of the university. There's only one tenured Rutgers professor who's been detenured, and that was for practicing slavery, all right? <laughs> Not for espousing creationist thoughts. So forget that fantasy. The second thing that I, w I don't want to waste uh, my time illustrating here is that um, uh, he makes the assertion let's just call it a falsehood to protect his feelings, that uh, there's not a single useful thing that's come out of evolutionary biology, and that's just uh, lack of knowledge on his part, or pure bigotry, or some uh, unique combination of the two that he's found comfortable to live with. Uh, when, you are t when you are treated uh, for a disease in a hospital, when you are given antibiotics, indeed when you are told to take them for 10 days for reasons he's given, when biological control agents are used to uh, control pests of, of, uh, of uh, plant species and even animal species that we depend upon, all of that work is based on evolutionary logic and a number of those uh, studies and advances have been made by evolutionists. So it's just another one of these Let's make a wild assertion and see whether we can get it by this audience. 
The final thing I'll say is that I've noticed a, uh, let us call it, disappointing level of emotional and intellectual development in some parts of the audience in which it seems that all you need to do to get straight on whether this uh, uh, universe evolved or did not is to cry for the name of Jesus and to say, Amen, brother, Amen. And go back and read the Bible as if every single word uh, was printed in stone and bypass, yes, yes. But even here, even here, there's biblical scholarship that, the, that this kind of uh, organism is not going to give you. And I'll just give you one example from Ecclesiastes. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth when thy strength waneth not, and you say, I shall have no use for them. Why them? Where's them in there? Well, the original word was not creator. The original word was temple prostitute. And the statement was, remember now thy temple prostitute, because that was the way you gave tithes. That was one of the ways you gave tithes in church back then. When your strength waneth not, and you have not, and when you do not say, I have no use for them, for the temple prostitutes. So if you want to take a kind of infantile approach towards scripture where you're not even willing to consider problems of translation and real meaning, well, That's one verse, you know. yeah, yeah.